Hey everybody, um, no fake sponsor for this video, and um, you're not going to see a fake sponsor for the next few weeks, and that's because we're coming onto the holiday season, and around this time of year, I like to take a break from the fake sponsors and promote the Animal Rescue League of Boston. This is an organization that does so much for homeless dogs and various other homeless animals. Um, it's an organization that I like to support just because they do a lot of good. So during this time of year, I um, encourage you all to visit the Animal Rescue League of Boston. I'm going to leave a link down below to their website. Go check them out. Donate if you can. Um, so for the Christmas season, uh, let's do some good for some homeless animals. <laughs> um, and with that, let's get on to this odd cult classic. Watch it, Alan. I'm shooting. Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. Take your $50,000, lover! In 1967, Valley of the Dolls came out, a film about the rise and fall of three young women trying to make it in show business. In 1970, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls was released as an unofficial sequel. A very unofficial sequel. Everybody involved in this movie flat out admits that this was a sequel in name only. The movie was directed by Russ Meyer and written by film critic Roger Ebert. Before he got into film criticism, he had worked with Russ Meyer on a few exploitation movies. He wrote the script for Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, and he wrote the story for two X-rated sexploitation flicks, Up, no, not that one, and Beneath the Valley of the Ultra Vixens. Which is why I find it weird that he went on to trash various other exploitation flicks. Well done, faithful vassal. Pray be excused. We have no further need of your services this night. Make sure you turn off the ovens. The film I'm feel up. We follow an all-girls rock band known as The Kelly Affair, soon to be renamed The Carrie Nation. We have Kelly, the main singer, the guitarist, Cassie, the drummer, Petanella, a.k.a. Pet, and the band manager, Harris, who's also Kelly's boyfriend. The group travels to Hollywood to try and make it big, which they do. But luckily for us, we get a fun, sleazy story as the group falls into a world of excess, full of sex, drugs, nudity, everything you could want in a grindhouse flick. This movie has every genre fighting to be part of the plot. Like my old man really blew his mind, you know? And he said he was gonna kill me if he found any more grass around the house. Escape, man. All right. And you're a moon child. And you're a bitch. Beyond the Valley of the Dolls is one of the tamer Russ Meyer movies. He got his start making sexploitation movies and nudie cuties. He was one of the earliest filmmakers who went all in on making his movies sexy, using well-endowed women, showing nudity. But he also made one of the earliest tough girl movies, Faster Pussycat Kill Kill. You better believe it. Hey! <laughs> The women in his movies were used to arouse the audience, but they were also depicted as strong women. They were usually the ones in charge of the situation, even when they were being titillating. He then got together with Roger Ebert to make Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, and even though this is a tamer movie for Russ Meyer, it still has plenty of sex and nudity. Not even a Bentley! Bentley! Family. It's like a rose! A rose! A rose! This is a fascinating movie, mostly because it's taking all these different genres and mixing them together, which sounds like a disaster waiting to happen, and it almost is, but the movie makes it work. It's a rock and roll movie, a love story, a drama, a coming of age movie, a tragedy, a comedy, all at the same time. It even 
turns into a bit of a slasher movie in the last 10 to 15 minutes, so there's something for everybody, even Grandma. I'd like to strap you on sometime. The fact that it all works together is what makes it good. This would fit into the category of what the fuck, but the good kind of what the fuck. It's not an abstract movie, but it is odd. It's one of those movies when, after you're done watching it, all you can say is, what? You're not sure how to feel about it at first, but as you go about your week, you can't stop thinking about it. The songs get stuck in your head. You remember the lines, you remember the characters, and then all of a sudden it hits you, holy shit, I liked that movie. This is my happening and it freaks me out. Oh, it's a stone gas, man. Pray, we must make haste, my time is not my own. Before the clock strikes 12, I must be back at first long. Not to say there aren't issues with the film. The editing is very choppy. Even more so than in my videos. <laughs> we'll be in one scene, watching the action of the scene, listening to the dialogue, and then when we switch to the next location, we instantly switch. We're in one scene, and then we snap over to the next scene. It's jarring. It creates transition whiplash. Porter, let me handle this. Does any party start? When you get there. Susan, please. We're late already. The other problem is the singing. Now, the songs are good, the music is great, but the problem is the lip syncing is a little off. The music overlay is a little off. When people are singing or playing instruments in a scene, it's obvious that they're not really singing. They're not really playing their instruments. Sweet talking old I do cut the movie some slack because the songs are damn good and the movie is very entertaining. But since this is a movie about a rock and roll band, the syncing needed to be a little better. There are many movies that don't play the music during the musical numbers and then just play the singing and the music over that in post-production. But you have to have everything in sync and a little neater just to keep the illusion for the audience. But again, it does not ruin the movie. This is an ensemble movie. We're following many different characters, but all the characters are memorable. Even the side characters, characters that are in the background, characters that are on screen for a few minutes to a few seconds are memorable. That weirdo and the old lady are memorable. I think it's better after the change. I'm with you. By that time, I for one was ready to roll over and fall asleep. <laughs> one of the standout characters is Ronnie Z-Man Bardell. He becomes the manager of the Carry Nation. He's this eccentric guy with this look on his face. He looks like he's always turned on, and everything turns him on. I'm sure she has. Have you run an audit on her books yet? Or are you still screwing on faith? Things take a turn with him in the final act, which I will not spoil here, but he's not the only standout character. The members of the Carry Nation all have their own stories, and each story is interesting. The main character, Kelly, meets her long-lost aunt and discovers that she's to inherit some of her family's fortune, but the aunt's lawyer tries to screw her out of her money and in bed. Kelly? Yes, Porter. Never mind, Porter. Kelly also deals with becoming famous, ending her relationship with Harris, and getting involved with this egomaniac named Lance Rock. Harris, meanwhile, becomes an alcoholic and gets involved with this adult film star named Ashley, who's only using him for sex. Harris, you're drunk and you're stoned. And the worst of it is, you're a lousy lay. You'll never get into one of my films. 
sweetheart. Unless maybe as a hairdresser. What do you mean? Then there's the drummer Pet, who falls in love with this law student named Emerson. We see the ups and downs of their relationship as Pet has an affair with a boxer, and then we watch as Pet and Emerson try to repair their relationship. Well, well, a buggeroo. I was hoping I'd find you here to personally thank you for those 30 days in the bucket. Who is it, Emerson? The delivery? We see the character Cassie dealing with a drug addiction, events happen in her life that eventually leads to her becoming a lesbian, and that's only a taste of what goes on in this movie. And the pacing is fantastic. It's about an hour and 49 minutes long, but it goes by fast. Not feeling the length of a flick is one of the highest compliments you can give a movie. Beyond the Valley of the Dolls is one of those exploitation flicks that I can recommend to anybody. This is a genre that has movies that not everybody is going to like, but I can see most people enjoying Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. It's weird in all the best ways, the characters are interesting and entertaining, it's a movie that you will not soon forget after you watch it. And with that, let's get to the Grindhouse rankings. There is a body count in this flick, but I can't go into details because it will spoil too much, so let's move on. There is a lot of nudity in this flick. Of course there is. It's a Russ Myers movie. The women in this film are proud of their bodies, enjoy sex, and are strong women with large breasts. The movie mixes so many genres together, you'd think that would hurt the film, but it makes it unforgettable. There's a large cast of characters, but they all get time to shine. There are main characters, but the side characters are also memorable. The music is very good. The dubbing could have been more in sync, but the songs are still good. The editing can be choppy at times. There could have been better transitions between scenes. Transition whiplash. And the final act is great. I will not say more than that. I'm giving this a 4.5 out of 5. It would be higher if the editing was better, but this is still a fun movie. Give it a watch. As always, I want to thank all of you for continuing to watch and support this channel. Please leave a comment down below. Let me know some of your favorite rock and roll movies. And please go check out the Animal Rescue League of Boston. It's a great organization. This is The Maniac, here to remind you that the grindhouse will never die. This is my scene, and it freaks me out. That doesn't sound right coming from me.